You are listening to Backstage Pass Podcast, hosted by Hannah Trigwell and brought to you by Tom. Hello, Leslie Gastonbird. How are you? Hi, I'm doing good. Thanks for inviting me onto the onto your podcast. This is amazing. It's an honor to have you on this podcast, actually. You're a, you're a re-recording engineer, mixing engineer, sound editor, and you also have a production company, right? Yes. So um, I'm speaking to you actually from my production company, Mix Messiah Productions, here in sunny Brighton, England. What is the thing that excites you most about working in audio? It's kind of crazy, but I love problem solving, you know. I love trying to, um, you know, most people get frustrated when things go wrong, but I think it's exciting because, you know, you have to solve problems uh, quickly. I'm also a pianist, so, you know, I when I was little, I took um, classical piano and I studied for years and years. And, oh, wow. Um, yeah, and it's the same thing when somebody says, oh, I wish I knew how to play piano. It's like, well, you know, you practice. And I think what makes pianists and engineers different is that sort of what do you do when there's when you can't accomplish this thing? It's like well, you have to break it down into, you know, for pianists, it's fingering, you know, which finger goes next and how do I get past this, this challenging piece? And for an engineer, it's error 9061. What is that? You know, <laughs> Pro Tools. Yeah. What is 9061? Go on the internet, figure it out. You know, clean the computer. So it's, it's, I think, the same mental process. Like, that won't stop a pianist or an engineer. Or, you know, um, for you, it's um, what you're dedicated to. Other people would say, you know, how do you make it through those challenges? And you're like, well, I love it, and that's why I do it. That's true. That's true. So it's Pro Tools here at DAW of choice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right there. Yeah. <laughs> when sound designer and sound tools first came out it was around 1990 1991 and I had already finished my undergraduate degree my um associate degree I actually have an associate degree in audio and a bachelor's degree in telecom anywho I had graduated and I went into the lab and there was this digital audio editor I'm like wow you know the waveforms are right there on the screen and oh you can select this this part and you can chop it like you do with tape that's amazing. And yeah, so that was my first experience with pro- what would become Pro Tools. And um, I've been using it professionally since 1998, but I first saw it when it was just a, a prototype, not a prototype. I don't know what it was, how they were marketing it in 1990, but yeah. Like a beta version or something. Yeah, maybe a beta version, yeah. yeah. So you wrote the book Women in Audio, so I wanted to ask, would you rather write a book or mix an album? I would definitely rather mix an album. Uh, writing a book is... A bit, but, but I wouldn't have given up the experience of writing this particular book, Women in Audio, and that's because it was transformative, you know. It puts you into... A group it puts you into a, a society and I think a lot of times as women in audio or women who are doing music technology um, we think you know we're so used to being the only one in a given environment and so writing this book is like no there's actually a lot of us out here yeah um, but I mean like right now, you know, um, I would rather be mixing totally. Has it changed how you approach music in any way? I mean, it's it's hard to tell because I've been doing so much film and television work lately. Right. Um, but I do still do music. I just mixed a piece um, like three or four months ago. One of my first gigs in this studio that I have now was uh, to mix an artist. It's knowing that if you have a challenge or a problem and you don't want to go to a traditional forum, you know, um, where all the guys are. You can ask the girls, you know, for a diff- different perspective. Yeah. And it's there's, I think, a lot less fear, you know, there that you can um, you can bounce your ideas, and then you find different people to work with. You know, like you, you just your network changes, you know, ba- based on. Um, like I was saying, the research that I did for this book introduced me to so many people and that it it's exponential, mm. you know, it's literally exponential. Um, once that network starts rolling, it's like you just meet new people every day. And it's amazing. The first time 
that I ever had a, a songwriting session with a with a female producer. And it was so different for me to to do that because all of the producers I'd worked with and all of the songwriters I'd ever worked with to that point had been men. From that session, then ended up having other songwriter sessions with other women and just just having different people to write with, I think is um is so valuable. But I'm sure that there are loads of people out there that want to work with you. How do you how do you choose which projects to work on now? I think it, it's a process of negotiation, but it's also a process of um, people being familiar with what it is you do. So, um, for example, I was just contacted about an immersive sound project because people know that I do a lot with multi-channel sound. And that's an easy one to say yes to because, you know, I'm thrilled, you know, to be part of and sometimes what is experimentation and sometimes, you know, these novel sound techniques. Um, and so those are, you know, I'm definitely going to jump at that. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of, you know, actual gigs, it's, you know, it's, it's a mutual fit. Like to make this completely uncomfortable, it's like dating. It really <laughs> is. It's, you know, it's like, will I get along with this team? Right. Um, what do I have to offer? What do they have to offer me? And, um, I've learned that what you don't want to do is just um, jump into the first thing that comes your way because then, you know, you're in a contract and then you're like, oh, this is actually really painful. You know, you've got to know who you're working with. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there's, I mean, I wish I had a better example than dating, but, you know, it's like <laughs> even when you join a, a rock band, like I've played in bands before, yeah. and it's the same thing. Like, oh, we're going to be committed to touring together and to, you know, taking the hard knocks together. We got to get along. Yeah. Um, so those, you know, maybe, okay, maybe I should have used, finding a good gig is like being in a band. That's a lot better. What are the most sort of fulfilling projects that you've worked on? I think the fulfilling ones are the ones where you can be creative and experiment. Uh, those are great. And so I worked on a, pro a film project uh, where the director was like, I want, you know, you are the sound person. I will take your guidance um, when it comes to these things. And you dialogue and you try things out and sometimes things don't work. Uh, those, those are really motivating where you have the freedom to just experiment. And I think that's why a lot of people, like I don't work in Hollywood, I've never worked in Hollywood, but one of the things that you find is that when you have, or one of the things I've heard, is that when you have a multi-million dollar budget and you have a certain amount of time, you have the freedom to experiment. Like for, I think Aileen Lee was telling us, she, she was a sound uh, editor and mixer for First Man. And she was talking about how, you know, the sound team went and then recorded rocket launches and all this kind of stuff. It's like, you know, for, wow. for a low-budget film, you're not going to Cape Canaveral and, <laughs> you know, getting permission from NASA to record rockets yeah. and all this kind of stuff. As an example, maybe you could. But it's I'm just trying to illustrate a point, and that's um, if you don't have a multi-million dollar budget, but you do have... A, time a timeline for the project that's a, a, a little bit loose mm. then and you have a director who trusts you then you can go out and you can take some of these chances and and find some really cool stuff so yeah and do you mm. find running like your business and academia and family life how, how have you been juggling that how's that going <laughs> that's not a juggle it's not that's, that's, it's, yeah, ju juggling is not the word I use okay. for it. It is, um, it's herding cats. It's right. insanity. It's chaos. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's putting fires out. It's, it's nuts, you know, but, um, I have lived a, no, screw that. I have never lived a placid lifestyle. I was going to say, I was, for some reason, I was silly enough to suppose that when I was single, you know, before I got married and had kids, like, oh, yeah, those were the days I was just sitting on the couch, <laughs> eating my sugary cereal, <laughs> watching Judge Judy. And it's like, no, I wasn't, you know? Yeah. Um, when I was single, I was working my ass off all the time because I love what I do. So, you know, I was working, going to school, I was in a band, I would pick up these freelance projects. Uh, 
Yeah, no, I, I just don't sit still. <laughs> it's not a lifestyle for everybody. And I'm not, I wouldn't even say I'm extroverted. Like, people are like, oh my gosh, Leslie, she's like this go-getter and la, la, la. No, I'm, I like to stay busy, mm. but I'm not like, oh, I thrive. I thrive on pressure and people and you know, I just, I thrive on problem solving and creativity. Speaking of great audio, what is your track of the week? The Hamilton soundtrack. My kids, you know, they had Hamilton on Disney Plus and so of course we rented it. I didn't know what the big deal was. I was like, ah, oh, a hip hop musical about a past president, but boring, you know. <laughs> and then I watched this thing, I'm like, that's catchy as hell. And then, like, we bought the soundtrack. My daughter really got into it. And now I'm like, I am not throwing away my shot. I, you know, it's just in my head. That was what I was playing on the way here. Nice. And it's, I, you know, those songs just stick. What is the best lesson that you've learned in your career so far? I would have, I would have probably moved to L.A. But that's not really a lesson. That's kind of a regret. Right. And it's not, it's really not good to carry regret with you. So I'm, you know bringing my happiness inside and I'm good with <laughs> yes. what's going on right now. Um, but the biggest lesson, okay, I'm going to turn this around. What do you think I'm going to say? Like, what do you think Leslie Gaston's big, big lesson was knowing what you know about me? I, I mean, I've heard that you said that writing the book was transformative in, a, in many different ways from hearing stories and maybe, um, I, I know from, from sometimes being obsessed with my own music that I can get tunnel vision and sometimes just getting perspective from other people on music or career and business, all of that stuff can be, ah. and life can be, can be just good to like, I like refresh yourself. So that's not I, what I thought that you would say, but maybe. <laughs> okay. Sort of, I'm getting, I'm sort of getting the tone here. Uh, I think the the thing, the lesson I've learned is this thing about manifestation. Right. And so I love telling people my age. I'm 51. I'll be 52 in May. And the this thing about manifestation, let's talk about it for a second. Somebody said, or a lot of people said, if you think you can do it, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. Or another another turn of phrase is, um, if you can dream it, you can achieve it mm. or, you know, do what you love and the money will follow. All of these things are actually true. Yeah. You know, and, um, it might take you two years. It might take you 20 years. It might take you 40 or whatever. Um, but I have heard from a couple people my age that, the way they expressed their manifestation came true and they wish they had manifested something else. So, oh. you know, all of those things about the genie in the bottle and you get three wishes and, yeah. and all this kind of stuff and then you live with the regret or the triumph or whatever and you have to choose wisely if you get those three wishes. Like, your life is your three wishes, you know? Yeah. You don't have to rub a bottle or anything, you know? Um and I think what happens is that um, you get what you work towards. Mm -hmm. And you better be clear about whether that's what you want. You know, um, I said I would love to have a family in my own studio one day. And, and here I am, you know. Um, I said that maybe when I was in my 30s or something like that. And... Um, yeah, I, I worked toward it and I got it. And now I'm sitting here and it's like, why didn't I say I want to live in Hawaii with my <laughs> own studio and a husband and kids? You know what I mean? Right. You got to be specific. You know? <laughs> I like warm climates. I've got to meet, you know, somebody who either lives to or wants to go to Hawaii. You know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, and like be cool with it if you don't get there. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, be careful. Be careful what you manifest, and then you know you. It's 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 all been said before. The Talking Heads, the song uh, "Once in a Lifetime," and you may say to yourself, "Where is my beautiful house? This is not my beautiful wife." I mean, like, <laughs> it's all cyclical, you know. I'm gonna be manifesting something else, and talk to me in ten years and be like, "I wish I had asked for something 
Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, but it's great news. Look, I mean, I'm giving you guys like this amazing news, and the news is you can, you can do this. Where where you apply yourself is that's the road you've chosen, and that's the journey that you've chosen, and you will arrive there. And it won't be what you think, but you're saying to the universe, this is what I want. And the universe is about to give it to you. So watch out. <laughs> Love it. Great answer. Thank you so much. Thanks for being such a great guest on this episode of Backstage oh, Pass thank Podcast. You. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to this episode. Be sure to hit subscribe and leave a comment to let us know what you think. And I will see you next time on Backstage Pass.